my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dave Messer. Uh, our speaker today is uh, visiting Boston for a few days. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Dr. Metzger is an assistant professor at the Edmund and Lillian Stauffer Center for Brain Sciences at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. That's right. Um, he did his graduate, undergraduate studies in the field of biochemistry in Tel Aviv University. He then worked with Professor Yanni Basov um, in uh, researching diffusion and resting state MRI in Tel Aviv University. Uh, he was then a postdoc uh, and a research associate in Professor Brian Wendell's lab at the Department of Psychology at Stanford University. And uh, Dr. V Dr. Metzger is known primarily for his groundbreaking work in kind of quantitative MRIs, really kind of showing us how far we can take uh, this technique if we really do uh, focus on each individual component that gives rise to the signal. Really looking forward to his presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. For thank you. Me. Thank you so much. Um, pleasure to be here. First time for me. Very exciting. Um, so I'm sitting in a neuroscience center. Uh, we have this beautiful building now. Um, and before I'm, so I'm gonna to talk today about um, molecular profile that maybe we, or I would try to convince you that we can actually uh, retrieve using multiple quantitative imaging methods. Um, and then I will show how this can be used for, and well, I will show example for aging at least. So how we, we use that to, to research aging. Uh, before I'm gonna jump into that, I would just mention in one slide other things that we're doing in the lab. Um, so, um, so it's true that we're using quantitative MRI and there is another project and some of it is scattered, but, but we, we try to now, uh, so this is a project of Faria, a student uh, in, in the lab, a PhD student, we try to use quantitative MRI to kind of remove some of the um, inherent bias or uh, uncertainty that we have in tractography and try to add uh, the quantitative information to, to essentially resecting and, and dissecting uh, pathways. Um, this work about laterality. Um, in which we work both on the on the on cortex and on, on the arcade fasciculus try to yeah it's really shifted but I guess that's what we have um, uh, looking on a on laterality and, and, the, and the last uh, line of work that is going on in the lab is about uh, external conduct connectivity and try to measure G ratio and, and with that trying to predict the uh, conduction delay I'm not gonna talk about any of those things today. Mm -hmm. okay. So what I'm gonna talk about is, is this idea of in vivo histology in which um, we will try to, to, to say something about the molecular composition with MRI. And, and I will then try to propose a new modeling approach, a new way to, to handle the data in order to, to expose this information. Uh, to do that, and then I will show you how we apply that to the human brain. So the beginning will be method and phantoms, and then, and then I will go to, to the human brain. Next will be aging, and the last bit will be about uh, testing, a, a, testing some kind of theory of, of aging, showing you that it actually can be useful for, for something. So let's start with this idea of uh, in vivo histology and aging in general. So in MRI, we typically have these measurements which are very macro scale, I would say. We're measuring things in millimeter and sub-millimeters, very big. And, and we do find atrophy, right? We can see changes, big changes in structure. Uh, in, the, in the severe case, of course, we say in Alzheimer, this is really bad, getting really bad and we're getting a, a huge loss of tissue. That's something we all know. And, and, we, and, and, it, and it's, it's something we can get with MRI. And we, there's many, many works showing different way of measuring morphological or structural gross anatomical change in the cortex and in white matter in general. On the other hand, if you look on the, on, when we look on our friends, so this is the idea of, yeah, of atrophy, right? Um, if we look on, on what's going on in, in, in more cellular level, people are actually talking about changing molecules, changing the makeup of, the, of molecules is, is function of, of aging, if you want. And the question, can we, I mean, and, and of course, it's much rich and, and much more, there's much more information that we would like to have about aging, which we cannot get right now on humans, right? So question, can we actually get, or, or, or do something with this gap and, and learn something about the change in the molecular composition? And of course, for that, given the problem of resolution, we would have to do some modeling, right? So, so that's clear. We would have to do some biophysical modeling, and we, if we're gonna get something, we're gonna get something on average. He didn't miss anything yet. Uh, um, so, and the way uh, we look at that at the lab, 
and I guess many of you as well, is try to use quantitative methods. So at least we have units. We kind of, it's a reliable measurement. We think we understand the, the, the physical unit of what we're measuring, and then we still have a gap, which is what is the biophysical meaning of all of that, right? And I would like to, to actually point to an, an article which I, two articles, several articles, but it's a work that came from, so this Kotarzik article from 94 is from Henkelman group. And this is an article that for me was really impressive and important. And that's from the, in, the, in the 90s, essentially. What they're doing in here, they put different phospholipids. So that's the thing that the membrane are built from in, in the brain, in, in everywhere in the tissue. They put it in the same concentration. They only change the, the type of phospholipids. So when it's say PC, for instance, this is phosphocholine. When it's a col, col, it's cholesterol. And sphingomyelin and so on. And what they're noticing is that both T1 T2 and MT varying as function of the type of phospholipids. So in this very, very early work, actually Koning was even earlier and he was saying that everything is cholesterol. And then after that, they were showing that it's not only cholesterol, okay? But what they're showing essentially, that the type of macromolecules that water sees, water interact with, affect the relaxation. So it seems that the information is there and it's actually known for, for a while. Um, and, in my postdoc, actually, so that's kind of now it's like a few years ago, I was really interested in that. So how can we actually retrieve this information? And I will try to show you how, or try to convince you that we, we're in, that, in the right direction. Um, and actually, you, you probably know, when you use clarity and just wash the lipids from the brain, then the contrast is gone, right? So it seems that lipids are actually critical for our MR signal. Um, okay, and now there is another view and when people talk with me, they typically talk with me about myelin. I say, no, no, it's not myelin. But, but there is this view, I would call it the myelin hypothesis, when we take different quantity measurements and say they are correlated with myelin. And they're actually very, really correlated with myelin. So for instance, this, in this work coming from uh, Bob Turner's group, they found that, so they compare histology, so quantitative histology of myelin versus MRI, it's post-mortem, and they were showing that in the wide matter, about 90% of the signal, the variation in, in the MR thing can be explained by changing in myelinization. And in the gray matter, it was about, the cortex was about 70%. It was also iron compartment. Um, but then there's other works, and I will just show you one example here coming from uh, Mark Doe's, when they use different rodents and they play with the amount of myelin that this, uh, this rodents has in their corpus callosum. So there's variability here in the, in the amount of, of myelin. And they compare, so the excess is in here is the histological, Frac, uh, volume fraction of, of myelin. And the, and the y-axis is either quantitative MT or multiple compartment T2. And here again, they find that there is a really nice agreement between amount of myelin and the quantitative measurement. So one option is that everyone is measuring myelin and we can keep finding this myelin, or my, my myelin is better than your myelin and so on. And I will show you what we did with this, the same data, mark those data, we just asked for the data, say let's calculate just proton density, just the fraction of water. And I would do one, one minus the fraction of water. That's the work of Shai. Um, and actually, we find that it's just the same. So it gives us the same agreement in terms of uh, myelin, water, myelin volume fraction. And my take of that is not that proton density is a measure of myelin, is that myelin or changing myelin is, chain, is, is really, when there is more myelin, there's less water. Okay? And so those things are correlated. So if we want a correlate of myelin volume, that's a good proxy. If we really want a real measurement of myelin, I don't know that we can get it with MRI. Maybe the multiple component T2 is, is, a, is a way, maybe, because the, the idea there is slightly different. But all the other methods, T1 and T, uh, proton density, we're essentially measuring the fraction of water, which happen to be highly correlated with, with myelin in normal brains. But it doesn't have to be always this the case. Um, so here's the problem, right? So, so I showed you before that, well, we're measuring the water and this water interacting with surfaces. And so it might be that we're measuring interaction between water and water proteins and their environment and that's what affect the relaxation. So we're sensing the environment, what this early work that I showed you before, or maybe we're just measuring the water, what, some kind of measurement of water fraction. And water actually is a big thing in, in the brain with about 80% of the brain is water. In the white matter, about 70%, okay, you don't see it much, but uh, in lipid and protein, uh, each of them about 10%. So that just to give you what, what, what we have playing uh, in the brain. 
And we see, when we see a change in, in say, in T1, this is a change between some young group to older group and somewhere in the white matter, what does it mean? It means that there is a change in myelin, there is a change in the molecular environment, there is a change in the water content, both. And can we actually separate that? So that's a question I'm, I'm, I'm putting here. Okay, so to, to try to answer that, I think what we need to do is first measure water content, handle that, and then, then try to predict the other thing, okay? And so to do that, we actually, so in, our, in, in, the, in this work, when I was doing uh, with Brian Wondell, we were showing that we have a, a really reliable measurement of water fraction. We call it MTV because it's one minus, and I didn't show you here the full uh, testing how and, and validation of that. I will show a little bit of that and checking that it's worked between the different, uh, if you sense, what is the main problem here, right? Receiving homogeneity, how we can change the, put the same subject with different receiver, different scanner, we're getting very, very similar result. So we think we have a good measurement of water fraction and one minus water fraction. We call it MTV. This is recent in which we, we actually put the H2O to D2O. So this gives us the fraction of the real fraction of water. That's a, uh, that's a classical phantom for, for measuring the fraction of water because we don't see the D2O in our uh, MRI measurement. And you can see that we have a very good, so this is the true fraction. We know it because we put it in, in the calculated one and we get a very good agreement. So we have a good measurement of water. This is recent when we actually did it on a brain. We took a brain, this is a porcelain brain, and it was fresh, freshly, but uh, ex vivo. And we scan it, and then we took a piece of a tissue, and what you do, you wait, and then, and then you evaporate the water and wait again. And so the difference in weight can, can be translated to a fraction of water. And we can show that we get a good measurement of the fraction of water. Um, so, this slide was supposed to convince you that we have a good proxy of the fraction of water in the brain. And I would say that if you have a question, do interrupt in the middle if you, I mean, if you, if you like. I, I, I would like that. Um, okay, so we have a measurement of the fraction of water. And now we, we remember that, we remember that. We remember that there is, there is supposed to be some sensitivity to the type of phospholipids. But I, I mentioned that in the, this early work, they never changed the fraction of water. They always kept the same fraction of water to show that, okay? So I'm gonna replicate that essentially. It's the work of, of a student named Oshrat. She built this uh, called liposomes, uh, which is a, you, you, you put essentially phospholipids, you buy phospholipids, pure phospholipids, and put them inside water in a way that, there is a technique, but not, not very hard. Uh, uh, and in the end, you, you get this um, bilipid layer uh, structure. It actually looks like an onion layer over, over a layer over a layer. Uh, and you can play with the type of phospholipids. And you can type, play also with the, with, the, with the concentrations. So it looks like that when you look at that in, in on, a, on a microscope. Um, and we put them just in a, in a plastic box inside the different um, um, small kivats, so small uh, tubes. We have an array of tubes here. Each of them either have a different phospholipid or different concentration of phospholipids or mixture of phospholipids. And we scan them and get the quantitative measurement on them. Okay, so we have now quantitative measurement of these phantoms. And I can show that it's super reliable. So we scan either the same sample day, day after day or you manifest it again because it's a very easy. So for chemists, it was, uh, this is like 60s. It's, it's, a, it's an easy, easy chemistry experiment. Um, so we get a very reliable uh, approximation in terms of uh, quantitative measurement on those samples and we can re manifest them. Okay. And then here is, the, here is the main result. I think this is the, the important slide. Everything else after that is just showing you more and more of the same thing, okay? So here's the, the notion. If we compare the fraction of non-water, the MTV, to say empty, this is an empty measurement, one of empty, and we find a linear relationship, okay, as we expected, because we said all of, of, all of those measurements are sensitive to, to water fraction, we get a linear relationship between the fraction of non-water and the amount of empty effect. This is for a particular, uh, this is PC with cholesterol, the, mo the most abundant phospholipid in the brain. Okay, so it's, we find a linear relationship, which makes it a little bit boring, right? It, all of the measurement is just a measurement of water. This thing. What is the point to do all this complicated quantitative measurement? But then we use here different phospholipids, okay? Each time it's a different phospholipid. And what you we find is that while the things are still linear, the linearity is different. 
Okay, so that's a that's a critical point here for for for, for my argument, is that the slope from the the, the derivation uh, of the quantity measurement against uh, the, the non water fraction is a signature of the phospholipids of the interaction between water and and the in its environment. So we're gonna call it relaxivity, like the relaxivity that we do with gadolinium, but here is the relaxivity of the tissue, tissue relaxivity. Okay, that's kind of the term. Uh, and so the tissue relaxivity becomes a signature of the molecular makeup. And in this case, when it, everything is simple, we actually can actually say which, which dependent is. So what happens if we add another measurement, let's say R1? So the, I'm sorry, it's cut, but the, the y-axis here is R1. And you see we also find a linear relationship, but, it's, but, uh, but the interesting thing is that things are are not exactly the same, right? So the slopes are not the same in here and in here. So it's something about adding other quantitative measurements, and this is actually a point of, for modeling now, why it looks in one way in R1 and looks the other way in MT, and I will show you T2 in a second. Each, each of them shows a little bit, create a different signature of, of the molecular makeup, um, but there is a point of, of mixing them together. Okay, so we can create this kind of spider plots, so this kind of visualization, this is for, for instance, for sphingomyelin. And in each axis, we put the, the derivatives. So this is for MT, and this is for R1, and this is for R2. So this is the signature for those two quantitative measurements um, for sphingomyelin. And here is the just other, other phospholipids. And you can see that we get this rich signature, which separate between the phospholipid here. OK? So I, I actually find it interesting that the information that we couldn't really and get before, and now we can, well, the reason I say we cannot get it before, I'm just gonna go one back, is that say we have a measurement, let's say we have an empty measurement. I really cannot, cannot if we just, just, just have the empty measurement, it's really hard to say if we are in a different concentration, right? Or so it could be in a different, it, it could be a different material, but with a different concentration, or a different materials with the same concentration. So having them both and doing this, this approach allows to separate this information. Okay. So one thing we might want to ask, is, can we do some kind of prediction? Or what happens when we put not a, not, a, not a pure phospholipid, but put a mixture? And so we, we, can, we can ask ourselves, is it just a linear, is it a linear system, just a linear system, or can be approximated as a linear system? So what we do in here, we say, let's, let's predict the empty signal as a, as a as a linear weight of the different phospholipid that we put. So we first get the, the linear model for each phospholipid and then ask if, if, if we just put, let's say, one to two ratio, two to one ratio, could you just predict the, the outcomes, okay? Okay, that's measured lipid and it's uh, the fraction. And the answer, it, it actually works, it's not perfect linear predictors. So it's not just linearly summed probably, but, but it, it's close to that. And this is different ratio of two of phospho, phosphocholine ver and uh, phosphoserine, two, two major phospholipids in the brain. Just one example, we have several. Um, and and the dif in different uh, ratios. And you can see that we have a, a good, relatively good predictors in, in terms of uh, the fraction of each of them in these phantoms. And given this is a linear model, we can re rewrite it, right? And because what we really want to know is, is the fraction. So we essentially rewrite it and, and make it a, a model of the fraction of the phospholipid. And in some cases, but not in all cases, we actually can get a very good predictors of the fraction of the phospholipid. This is, goes well for, for phosphoserine, for sphingomyelin. So in these cases, we get a very good predictors uh, of, the, of the phospholipid in this phantom world. Okay, I just wanna say this is not true only for phantom, uh, only for lipids. Unfortunately or not unfortunately, MR signal is not specific to, to just to phospholipid. When we put, um, so BSA is a type of protein, and, and uh, here we have glucose and sucrose, we also add iron. Each of those things actually affects this relaxivity measure. So also probably in the brain, it's not only a function of, of lipids. Lipids are important, but in terms of specificity, we probably don't have all, when measuring in the brain, when everything is complex, we get a signature of the molecular composition, composition, but not exactly a specific measure of a specific phospholipid, right? So, so you, you see what I'm saying here. 
Okay, so now maybe I convince you that, that, uh, that this, this is a good idea, and now we can try to, to ask how can we use that in the brain. Okay, so as we said before, we're gonna think about that the brain is like a big fatty tissue with water around, and we really wanna know something about the ensemble of macromolecules in, on the membrane, for instance. And it, it's a complex piece, right? It's like many type of phospholipids there. And unfortunately, we kind of like mask by water. So we need to remove the water or control for the water and, and we may be gonna get a sign the signature. So the same idea, the same idea. Um, so what we, do, we are doing, we, so this is a work of shear and, 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 and we're measuring several quantitative measurements. So here we have R1, MT, R2, so nothing fancy. And also we did mean diffusivity, there was a question and MTV, and, and we segment the brain to different uh, region, and, and, and then we're gonna ask ourselves, can we, can, can we find a signature per region with this, this method? So I'm gonna show you an example of, of one sub subject first. Let's say we take one region, the polydon here, and the first question was, was it, it gonna, will it be linear? So I'm looking on the empty values within these regions and compare it here to empty. So this region seem to be linear in this subject, okay? And then I'm, I'm gonna take another region. Uh, I think this was the frontal white matter. And it's also linear, and, but with a different slope. And here is the thalamus, also linear, different regime by the way, different M MTV values. Um, uh, and the slope is not very different than, than the, the white matter in this case. But then if we change the measurement, say R1, so now those two seem to have the same slope and then the white matter had a different slope. So again, so what, what, we showed in, what I showed you in this case of single subject three regions, but just was an example, right? The idea, the idea is that we find linear relationship, the linearity is different between regions and using multiple quantitative measurement seem to be useful uh, to tease them apart. I still need to convince you that they are rela they're related to, to the macromolecular com uh, composition in this tissue, but that will be next. Okay, first let's see what happens if we look on many regions and many subjects. So here is a 20 something, something subject, and this is the slope, if you want, or the relaxivity of each region. The color represents the regions, and, and, and this is a across subject. So you, you can see that we have signature, which is, which is kind of, um, constant across subjects and really separating between regions. So in terms of signal, it seems to be a reliable signal across subjects, okay? And again, we can see that both measurements that give us, they're not exactly the same. There is additional information here. Okay, so we can do again this uh, spider plot kind of representation as also adding the R2 and the diffusion. Um, and we get these beautiful images of signature per region. And you can think that you can add more, you can do it for, for, your, for cortex, for layer and so on. I mean, what our data allows us is to do that, but that could be, could be richer. Um, okay, so we have this unique signature per region. Now the question is it has to do uh, with molecular composition, right? Because fine, you have, they have this signature, what, what, why should we care? Um, and so we try to find any some type of uh, post-mortem work that look on the phospholipid composition across brain regions. And it was uh, actually, we find it hard, actually. Uh, there wasn't so many work was doing lipodomics, it's called, lipid analysis across brain regions. People doing typically per region, maybe for, for a disease, or something like that, but not across the brain. We actually were able to find this very old work from the 90s, we actually were talking with the, with the author, was so happy someone created this art. Um, and they were doing six or five type of, uh, of uh, phospholipids. We're talking here only on the heads, heads of phospholipids. I'm not talking about the chain at all. There is a fat, fatty chain, which I'm totally ignoring for now. Only the heads of phospholipids. And he measured those five type of phospholipids. He also measured cholesterol, which is not in this graph, and the ratio of lipid to protein. So the total is seven measurement on seven regions. So that's what we got for this post-mortem work, I think, six brain or three brains, I don't remember. I need to check again how many brains they, they measure it. So they have kind of a reliable measurement across brains for those, for those measurements. And we have our four measurements 
can do it for each of those, the, the region they did. So we have here, we want to do a comparison between those things, but we have seven regions, seven measurements for each region against four measurements for seven. So just too many comparisons, something will happen for sure, and we wouldn't know if it's good or not. So what we did is doing a PCA. We just take the first, the main, if you want the axis of change for the molecular composition from postmortem, and then the main axis of, uh, so PCA of the, of the QMRI signatures, and we just try to uh, look one against the other, see if we can actually get put some prediction between them, some agreement between them. So this is the brain region, sorry. Um, and this is what we get. So you can see this is the MRI in vivo, measured in Israel 20 years after. And, and this is a uh, ex vivo measurement measured in Sweden uh, on, on other, on postmodern brain. So what you find is that actually we have a, a very interesting agreement between those, two, between those measurements. Okay, so it seems that our signature that we measure with MRI is in, is in good agreement with, with this molecular signature that was measured postmodernly. Uh, across the across regions at least, and and it was better than, than just using the qu quantitative image images the, themselves. So the, the, the signature was actually useful and important. Okay, so we can do now the same trick. We can write a linear equation again and try to predict the fraction. Am I going too fast? Because I feel like I'm, I'm rushing. Okay. So then the signature on the previous slide is some of the in vivo, some sort of mixing of all the different uh, MR measures. So we have four, we have four, four signature, right? If we had four, if we had MTV measurement and we do the slope per region <laughs> pair for R1, for R2, for NP, and for diffusion. So end up we having four signatures. So the four dimension non data per region. And you look across this region, you can ask what is the main Axis of change across the region in MRI. So that would be, that's a PCA But it's some it's sort of weighting of those four signatures. Yes, it's weighting. And, and one of them is unimportant. So I can say that you're right. And in, in those regions, in those seven regions, and also in other regions, when you look in the court, it's what it's saying, in that R1 and MT explain most of the variance. And while R2 in diffusion in our end didn't seem to change too very much. Or that we're not contributing a lot to the PCA. Um, on the other, R1 and MT are not very different from each other. So it's kind of like, is a main driver here. There, there, are, there are some differences between them. Okay. And it might be that if you had other measurements, let's say R2 star or a, some kind of suitability, maybe we do better MT, says, and so on, we might get more information, but this is what we have. So that, just yes. What is it like? So I don't have the figure here. It it doesn't. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't as good. And I will show you additional information. Additional. I will show you that in, in two slides when we do a direct comparison, because the reviewer saw that say this is great. Now show show me that in in the same frame. So so we had to do replicate everything. Now on on, on not just comparing between data sets, but measuring on the same brain, and then I will show you what happens. But before, I will show you that we can try to, to, do, to do this linear equation uh, uh, trick, and we can try to, so we can train the model essentially on six area and predict the seventh, and see if it works, and we can predict the fraction of, of, of a phospholipid. And in some case, we could, we could, we could with the case of sphingomyelin, we try only those three, because again, you cannot do it too much. So we take the one which was, have the highest weight, in the ex vivo data, in terms of what, what was changing across regions in, the, in these seven regions. So sphingomyelin, was a, we were able to predict the, 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 the fraction and the ratio of phospholipid to, to proteins. That was also something that could be maybe uh, predicted with MRI in this state. Okay. Okay, so then there you say, okay, nice, now do it again, but do it yourself. Uh, do the lipodomics, do the MRI on the same brain. And, and let's see what's, go, what's going on. So that was hard for us because we, we're not a lipidomics uh, lab, but we, we find a way to do it. So what we did here, we, we scan a two porcine brain that was ex vivo, fresh. And so the first thing is that we, we also find in this data set, uh, uh, we, we, we can find this linear relationship 
uh, also in this in this postmortem fresh grains, and we can find signatures. And now we take samples per region, and and the sample are not in the same size of the measurement. Of course, they're, they're actually tiny, so you take like like a small biopsy from from the tissue, and you send it for the lipodomics analysis, and you use some kind of a coulomb against some kind of a standard and you try to separate within the different phospholipid and I was sure that it, that will be a gold standard and I figure that you think that the, the ex vivo histology is a gold standard and then you figure out you discover that they're not as great as you would like them to be but still we, we have this this lipodemic measurement and so it looks like something like that this is for instance the, the polar phospholipid and this is the non-polar phospholipid so we have about 10 phospholipid that we could separate per region and we have about 20 something regions and this is the agreement between the first PCA of the MRI versus the, the first PC of, of the uh, lipodomics. And, and we find again, this, there is agreement between this relativity signature to, to the lipodomic signature. Now you ask what happened if you use the other measurement and they were really bad. So just, just the, the first PCA on the quantitative measure, not to take the deriv derivative with, so say, of water or just looking on the water, both of them were not really in good agreement with this lipodomic signature. So at least in our, in our hand, it was seems to be, in both cases, in both data sets, it seemed that taking this relaxivity approach uh, seemed to be better in predicting the molecular composition. Okay? I wouldn't say that there's nothing of this information in the, in the R1, for instance. It must be, right? It's it coming from that. But R1 is also dependent on the fraction of water, and fraction of water is not really dependent on the type of phospholipid that you want. So this is the added value. Okay. Um, the last bit of um, comparing to histology was looking on, on gene expression. So we say, okay, there is, there is data set about uh, gene expression across the cortex, at least, in the Allen Brain Institute. Is our signatures relate to anything, uh, any of that? And so what they typically do in these data sets, um, they first find the, these they call modules, which is essentially family of genes that co-vary together across the cortex. And they typically find something like um, 19, yeah, 19 modules, uh, which co-vary together across the brain, okay? And they also tag them with names according to what kind of cell processes they are part of. So it could be like a synaptic or a blood vessel, or things like that. Um, and so we try to find if there is any a uh, family or module of genes that co-vary uh, along the cortex with our signatures. And we find two that were highly correlated, or I don't know, moderately cor correlated. Uh, it was the synapse and membrane modules. So I didn't make the names, but they're always nice that that's the name that, you, that pops. Um, and so what I want to say here, I, I don't think this is not a very different than the other one. This is not direct measurement of something about this. The, the molecular composition. But it seems that those signature are, does represent something about uh, the molecular composition, which in, in the end been shown in this uh, uh, gene models. I think these gene models are, are mostly sensitive to type of cells. I think type of cells are sensitive to the type of molecules that we see. So that's, that's my connection in my brain of, of, those, of those measurements. Okay. Let's just say that. So the last thing I want to show is how this relates to aging. Okay. Oh, essentially I show you some kind of approach to look on our data, and maybe a new way to look on our data. Could it be useful for anything? And 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 we went to aging. Um, and as I mentioned before, can we say something about molecular change? The change in molecular composition. We know it exists. Can we actually pick it up? Um, so that's come from, from earlier work that I was doing uh, still at Stanford uh, in which we look on the, on the quantitative measurement itself as a function of uh, age and we found that there is this uh, increase and decrease, this, in this case this is R1 and change in R1 and we look in the white matter in this case and we found that things are changing uh, in this parabola shape. There was, there was increase and decrease um, and it was different across different uh, white matter, it was interesting that when we compare it to diffusion, while the peak was kind of the same, the shape uh, was different and it was, and we really couldn't 
predict the change in, that's what we have in here. We couldn't really change the, the, the mean chain in R1 in per region by, by diffusion. Well, it seems that they're sensitive to different things. So if it's only driven by water, and maybe both of them are sensitive to water, then we would be, have a good prediction. But it seems that there was a little bit more in here. And so with this, this thing in mind, we, we went to this, to this work uh, on, on brain aging uh, with the signature. So the question in, in the end is, the, are those signature vary as function of age? Okay, so that, and it's actually, it's very rich and it's too much to show here. I'm gonna show you just three examples, give you a flavor of what we find, okay? And I think, okay, and then I will say what, I, what I'm thinking. So the question, what, what is changing when we see a change like that uh, for, uh, for, for, for uh, different groups uh, with different age? Is it water, is it molecular composition, is it both? So here's one example, huh, and you don't see it well, but this is MT, and, and in this case, we didn't find a change. Ah, oh, you don't see that, do you? You should believe me that there is something gray in here. <laughs> and this gray thing is the, is the older group. Oh, uh, older group. And in this case, I, I pick, I cherry pick this region. In this case, when we somehow didn't find a change between a young and, and old group, in these uh, cortical regions. Uh, also, I want to say that all of those things actually, I think, uh, have some should resonance. Think that you are some of you are actually thinking about when you're looking on cortical uh, thickness and the ability to segment and all of those. Actually, I think all those things are not separated. Say that, and then I'm continuing. Um, in this case, we find that there was there was a change in the signature and there was a change in the water. They were op opposing each other in a way that we didn't find a change in this MP. Okay. That's, that's a, uh, a case, particularly not a typical case, but an interesting case. And in general, we can look on this signature. Um, and again, in gray, you see the, 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 the older group. And we find a quite big effect in some of the measurements, in this case also in diffusion, uh, as, as function of age. So we have here, I think, more information. And if you want more than just say there is atrophy, we have now more layer of, of, of uh, information. And you can see that it's varied between regions. This is, uh, this is Caldat. And here again, we actually did find a change in, in R1. And, and in this case, there was no change in the water fraction, but it was only in the signature. Okay, so just to give you the sense that there, there are different flavors of changes that we can pick with this kind of analysis. And this is the full different measurement. And there's even more information here. I'm not gonna get into it now. Uh, last, last one I want to show you. This is the case. This is again R1, and this is in the in the thalamus. And in this case, everything changed. So that's also an option. Both water there is change in the water fraction, but also in the in the molecular composition. All of those things change. Is the signature, please? So do you think some of this variability is an underlying variability or not? Mm -hmm. Do you have to apply 23 people, or is it just acquiring one person? So it's an MR related or yeah. is it underlying? Yeah. So I, I don't, I mean, I will say something. Fitting a, 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 a linear trend to data which have noise and they will, some of this linearity will be driven just by, by noise. And we can simulate that and that's true. We do believe and we, with simulation it seems that we cannot explain all these things with noise. I will say more, when we, we do scan rescan on the quantitative measurement, each of them at least, they seem not 100% reliable, right? Because there is noise, but they are pretty reliable. Uh, the R square, the so, uh, co coefficient of determination is around point, almost point 0.9 typically in our, on our hand. Uh, although it's a long measurement, about 25 minute measurement. Um, so, and, and with the fundo as I showed you, we can show that when you, f you see a different, and we then, again, we find the same, by the way, we find the same level of reliability with phantom scan, we scan versus human. So it actually was comparable in terms term of noise. Like the viewer make us do that. That's good comparison. Um, and, and the slope were different in a way that was, cannot be just explained by, by noise. So I do, but, so to say that everything here is just uh, true changing molecular composition, that's too much. I don't know that they can say that. But I, I do believe that you cannot explain it just by noise. 
and maybe you will test it and you, I mean, I would love that people would test it, right? Um, okay, so my point was, I think we, we, we can get a richer explanation of aging, which is more than just atrophy. So it's not just change some kind of morphological change, it could be volume or quantity. I think, I think there is much more. And I think with this type of analysis, we can start sensing that. I think we're just in the beginning of checking if it's useful. Is it, some people ask me, is it useful for obesity? Is it useful for uh, Alzheimer's? I don't know. We should go and check. All of them might have an have effect. But that's, uh, I hope people will check and we will check as well. Okay, so just the last bit is to show you uh, an example of how we can compare between measurements. And are they all just, yes, it's kind of the same. So there are two theories that we can find in the literature, literature about aging. One of them was talking about common cause. One thing changed, everything changed. So if you, change, you have a change in your eye or you have a change in atrophy and, all that, and it's everywhere, you're gonna be look like that. Also molecular composition. The other one, one is kind of the mosaic approach when different things change in a different way in different regions. Um, so if you want, it's a local, the local effect, uh, there is a lo lo local effect of, of aging. And so the, uh, so the prediction is in one of them that if you measure one, you will measure them all, and the other one, they, they will be separated across regions. And so what we did, we, we measured the molecular composition. We also measure water content because it's, it's coming for free. Like both of the coming. We measure atrophy, which is just volumetric change, volume change. And we measure iron. In this case, we approximate that with auto star. As good as it is, it's not, it's not a perfect iron measurement, but it's, it's a good proxy of iron fraction. And we try to ask, are they covariate together or they're different between regions? And this is, this is kind of like, so the y-axis in here is the effect size, how much change we see from, uh, from the normal group. And x-axis is different brain regions, the same region I, I use all the time, okay? And you can see that we have this, um, and this is a cross subject. So this is how much change we find across regions. And this is the other measurements. So the, uh, and you can see they actually don't really correlate. So the correlation is, is actually poor between those measurements. The one that correlates the best is atrophy and iron, just saying. And that was actually was shown before. We actually, done, after that, we discovered that, that people were sharing that. There is some relation between cortical atrophy, at least, and, and iron uh, deposit is measured with, with auto star. And if we just color it according to the one that has the biggest effect, you get the mosaic. And, uh, so we think this is an evidence for the mosaic kind of uh, uh, theory of aging. Okay, with that, I'm just going to conclude. So what did I show you? I showed you that, uh, that all quantity measurements seem to be set, uh, dependent on the fraction of water, the fraction of non-water. So in a sense, there's something that uh, we want to call it different, in different name, mine and so on. In, in a way, we have a very strong bias toward measuring fraction of water. And we need, if we, but we can account for that. And when we account for that, we can get, at least in the phantom case, we get a, can get a, a, a really um, a signature, a unique signature per, per, per type of molecule. Okay, that was in the, in the, in the phantom system. Uh, and also show, was showing that, um, uh, that those, um, that we can find this type of signature also in the brain, and they were unique per region if we combine multiple measurements, and they were, they were consistent across subjects. So we find some kind of a signature per region but seems to be related to the molecular composition. I try to convince you that it's related to molecular composition by comparing to post-mortem work. And then I show you that when, when measuring on, on different two groups, and the two groups I select was, was group of a young adults versus their age group and sometimes we make fun that is between the student in LSEC, the, the center and, and the professor. And that's actually, that's most of the subject. And we found this different of aging of, of the signatures. And, uh, and that was also useful to, to try to kind of maybe different, different biological source of, of the change. And with that, I'm gonna end. I'm just gonna say thank you. Uh, so Sheer and Oshrat were the, the one that made most of the work that I showed you. Thank you for the funders and thank you for listening.